Welcome back to the Maritime History Podcast. I'm Brandon Hubner, and you're listening to Episode 12, Minoan Thalassocracy. Today, we'll look at the maritime evidence connected to the Minoan civilization, and we'll try to find the line between reality and some of the supposition that's taken place in regard to the Minoan people. A few introductory matters before that, though. First up is to, again, give you a bit of explanation as to why there's been such a gap between the most recent episodes. I'd hoped that the gap wouldn't happen, but I'm not entirely surprised that it did, to be honest. You see, the last month plus has been full of the last exam period of my law school career, finishing up projects, working part-time, and then graduation, now on to bar exam prep. So, unfortunately, the podcast got put on the back burner until after the academic load was lifted, but I should be able to put some more time into the podcast episodes now that classes and exams are over and done with. There is that small thing that I have to worry about at the end of July, the bar exam, but I'm aiming to still get some episodes out in the meantime. I'm also involved in a few other projects with other podcasts that I think you'll enjoy, and I'll share more about those as they continue to progress. One of those recent projects was a guest episode for David Crowther's History of England, so check out his podcast to see how that turned out. I greatly enjoyed the research for that episode, and I think it turned out pretty well. Anyway, thanks so much for all your continued patience and support over the last few months. Next, I want to say a big thank you to the podcast's first three patrons through our Patreon page. Those patrons are Mary, Levant, and Gregory. I know that Mary has been a faithful supporter since the very start of the MHP, and I'm very appreciative of her support and encouragement. Thanks is also due to Levin and Gregory both, and although I'm not sure how long they've been listening, the support means a lot as we continue to move forward. If any of the rest of our listener base is interested in lending support, there are links on the website and more info about rewards like stickers or postcards for patrons. Last but not least on this topic, Many thanks to Thomas as well for the recent PayPal donation. I'm sure the donation will help me obtain a book, or five, for some upcoming research, so I'll be sure to let you know what I end up getting to serve as source material for our upcoming episodes. Next, I wanted to share with you my thoughts about a book that I received a copy of recently, and let you know that I'll be doing a giveaway for a copy of this book. Stick around until the end of today's episode for instructions about how to enter the giveaway. The book is titled Wreck of the Whale Ship Essex, the extraordinary and distressing memoir that inspired Herman Melville's Moby Dick. I'll share some more detail at the end of the episode today, but the shortened version is that I recommend this book highly. It's a fully illustrated edition of the memoirs written by Owen Chase, who was the first mate on the Essex when it was sunk by a sperm whale in 1820. The incident became the basis for Melville's Moby Dick, and more recently for Nathaniel Philbrick's book In the Heart of the Sea, the film version of which is slated for release at the end of this year. This illustrated edition of Wreck of the Whale Ship Essex is great because it contains the first-hand account, along with a good selection of supplemental essays or short pieces that give good insight into the whaling industry in the 19th century, and the various details related to whaling ships and the life aboard a whaler. If you want to hear my other thoughts on the book, stick around at the end of the episode. Otherwise, I'll include links to the book and some other info on the website page for today's episode. If possible, though, Stick around until the episode's conclusion to hear about how you can win a free copy of this well-done illustrated edition. And finally, in this long-winded intro today, thanks to Paula Sulla, Ratatat Pat, and Kevin IC Designer for the recent reviews on iTunes. 
As usual, ratings and reviews help boost us on the iTunes charts and, in theory, help gain exposure and thus more listeners. So take a minute to leave a rating and or review if you're able to. Now down to business. I have to say at the outset today that the Minoan civilization has been, so far in our narrative, the biggest surprise to me personally. For some reason, in my mind, the Minoans had always occupied a place of pseudo-familiarity, especially in comparison to the Harappan people that we looked at earlier. The Minoan name is familiar, and the myths associated with them and King Minos are among some of the most recognizable in Greek mythology. I may have been a bit off base in my admittedly ignorant assumptions about the Minoans, and my ignorance about the Harappan civilization is sadly common in the West, anyway, though that's no excuse. As I hope to convey through this episode, for all the name recognition that the Minoans may have in today's world, or at least had in my own head in the past, we actually don't know a whole lot about the culture or about details of the Minoan people or their civilization. Concerning that name recognition, the name Minos tends to evoke images of myth and legend, at least if you're anything like me it does. The earliest of true civilizations to occupy the island of Crete has come to be known as the Minoan civilization after the mythical King Minos. In the Odyssey, the hero Odysseus is asked to tell of his lineage, and the beginning of his responding story goes something like this. There is a country, Crete, in the midst of the wine-dark sea, a fair land and a rich begirt with water. The people there are many, innumerable indeed, and they have ninety cities, Their speech is mixed. One language joins another. Here are Achaeans, here brave native Cretans, here Sidonians, crested Dorians, and noble Pelasgians. Of all their towns, the capital is Knossos, where Minos became king when nine years old. Minos, the friend of mighty Zeus and father of my father, bold Deucalion. The allusion in this passage of the Odyssey, which is more explicitly stated in other places throughout Greek mythology, is that King Minos was a son of Zeus himself. The famous stories affiliated with Minos, for example, the Minotaur in the labyrinth that Minos had built beneath his palace at Knossos, in addition to his supposed divine lineage, should serve as somewhat of a red flag that Minos may not have been an actual king. When it comes to Minos, the debate tends to be about whether mythical figures like him were completely real, completely mythical, or somewhere in the middle. The argument that they were rooted in history, but elaborate mythology gradually evolved to the point that any distinct line between fact and fiction has been smudged beyond recognition. As we now delve into the specifics of what we call the Minoan civilization, I'd like to frame our discussion in terms similar to the debate that surrounds King Minos as a historical figure. The best person to give one view of the Minoans in history is none other than Thucydides. In describing some background history in his treatment of the Peloponnesian War, he describes Minos and his realm as an empire or a thalassocracy, something I'll define a bit further in a minute. Thucydides then says this, Minos, according to tradition, was the first person to organize a navy. He controlled the greater part of what is now called the Hellenic, or Aegean Sea. He ruled over the Cyclades, and it is reasonable to assume that he did his best to put down piracy in order to secure his own revenues. Thucydides then describes a Minoan empire that exercised direct control over a large part of the Aegean, a view that proponents of our first interpretation share. This theory posits an actual, historical Minoan thalassocracy, 
that existed in historical fact, and that saw Minos rule an empire covering a majority of the Aegean Sea, based at his palace at Knossos on Crete. The second camp holds a different theory, and this camp comprises a more recent trend in historical interpretation. It's made up of those who believe that the numerous islands of the Aegean were politically autonomous from Crete, and that Minoan influence in the greater Aegean was merely economic and cultural, even if there may have been a small measure of diplomatic control from Knossos. What I hope to do in the balance of today's episode is to not necessarily take one side or the other, although I probably will by the time we're said and done. Rather, I want to try and give a good overview of the main arguments from each camp, along with the historical framework within which these arguments are framed, leaving you to draw your own conclusions about which camp has a stronger position. Before that, though, let me briefly explain that weird word I've used a few times now, thalassocracy. The word is of Greek origin, and it's rooted in two Greek words, thalassa, which means sea, and kratine, a verb that means to rule. The two words put together make up the word thalassocracy, which literally means to rule the sea or rule of the sea. It's now used as a descriptive label for states that are primarily maritime empires, or states like the Phoenician civilization, which I promise we'll get to cover in due time. So now that we've seen the two alternative arguments, and we've seen just what exactly a thalassocracy is, let's get into the history of the Minoan people of Crete and beyond. The origin of the Minoan people is shrouded in the mists of prehistory. Archaeological evidence has shown evidence of settlement on Mediterranean islands as far back as Neolithic times, and this should really come as no surprise to us. The geographic reality of the Mediterranean is that many small but scattered islands are oftentimes close enough to one another that they can be seen with the naked eye. It takes little imagination to picture the earliest of mankind venturing his way toward an in-view piece of land, ultimately resulting in the prehistoric presence of man on the numerous Mediterranean outposts. The island of Crete became the site of comparatively concentrated settlement in Neolithic times, likely due to its location off the western coast of Anatolia and at the southern end of the Aegean Sea and the Cyclades. That same location, though, can also be seen as a bit less accessible than most of the smaller islands of the Cyclades, or even the island of Cyprus, a point that's made by Fernand Braudel in his brilliantly written history, Memory and the Mediterranean. It's not really within our scope to focus on the Neolithic origin of the Minoans, but Braudel paints an image of a burgeoning civilization in the Aegean even before the Bronze Age. He refers to it as a quasi-Aegean civilization, consisting of the Cyclades, the mythical yet historically provable city of Troy, Crete, and the Hellespont. This civilization, claims Braudel, was dramatically snuffed out by the Indo-European invasions around the 24th century BCE, which saw the ancestors of the Mycenaeans in Greece and the Hittites and Loites of Anatolia, overrun the quasi-Aegean civilization and effectively erased the early economic and cultural levels that they had reached. According to Braudel, it was Crete alone that survived this downfall and remained intact enough to have an edge once the Bronze Age began. The long and short of any human activity that we see on Paleolithic Crete for our purposes, is that there was some. Since Crete is an island, we know that a fair amount of activity there, and any trade or commerce that took place with other civilizations, had to have done so via a water route at some point. The Bronze Age in Crete is generally placed as starting somewhere around 2700 to 2600 BCE. But the period wherein the Minoans began building the imposing palaces for which they're now remembered, places like Phaistos and Knossos, 
didn't begin until at least 1900 BCE. As I've said, though, for centuries before the Minoans began constructing their palaces, they were constantly traversing the Mediterranean in boats and ships. Surprisingly, for all that activity, we have yet to find a shipwreck or even a visual depiction of a boat from early Bronze Age Minoan Crete. What we do have, however, are a few clay ship models, two specifically. One comes from Palakaistro, a village on the eastern end of Crete, and the other from Moklos, a small island that sits off the coast of Crete within the confines of the Gulf of Mirabello. Both of these models are roughly dated to the mid to late 2000s BCE, so they represent Minoan boats prior to the palatial period. The Pelicastro model is fairly unique as far as the shape goes, especially in comparison to the early boats of the other cultures that we've seen so far. One end of the model has a sharp raised point to it, while the other end has a flat, step-like projection sticking off near the bottom of the boat. It is surmised that the tall pointed end was the stern of the boat, while the flat projecting piece has been called a forefoot and has been interpreted as either being useful for beaching the boat or for use as a step upon re-entering the boat once it's pushed off from shore. Either way, the profile of the boat model bears a distinctly fish-like shape, perhaps just the visual effect that its Minoan creators were seeking. The Maklos boat model also has relatively high ends, though this model is symmetrical, similar in that fact to some of the boats that we've seen from Mesopotamia and Harappa. In any event, both of these models seem to be representations of small boats that would not have been used for long-distance transport on the Mediterranean and were almost assuredly used for local transport and travel among the islands of the Cyclades. The earliest iconic depictions of boats from this time period are slightly younger than the Minoan boat models, but precise dating is difficult. They're also not strictly tied to the Minoan civilization specifically, and the best example was discovered on the small island of Syros in the Cyclades. Similar examples have been found on the Greek mainland and even in Anatolia, so although the ships depicted may not have been in use by the Minoans, they just as well could have been, and they were at least used by peoples that had close association with Crete in the early Bronze Age. The objects themselves are commonly called frying pans for their resemblance to our modern idea of a frying pan but we actually don't know what these ceramic objects were used for originally. They've commonly been found in graves, and their high levels of decoration and imagery suggest that they were items possessed by the wealthy class. Thankfully for us, an image or scene that was commonly depicted on these frying pans, or disc things, is that of a ship in water. Thirteen separate depictions of ships have been found on these pans, and by and large they all depict similar styles of water vessel, a boat or ship with a horizontal hull and one end sharply raised, with the other either not raised at all, or if it is raised, only slightly so. Generally then, the boats seem to resemble the boat model found at Pelicastro. I don't believe I mentioned this earlier, but the shape and the single extreme raised end in these depictions are suggestive of boats that could be either of wooden planked construction, but they could also possibly be log longboats with decorative fittings. The frying pan depictions also contain short angular lines above and below the hull, generally accepted as representing oars or paddles though they're not likely to be to scale, and thus they probably don't represent the number of paddles, and we can't then extrapolate the size of the ship. The image of a frying pan ship that I'm going to post on the website also shows how the Cycladic artists would depict waves as being spirals that surround the ship, 
an effect that results in a piece of striking beauty. These few items together give us a decent picture of the fact that pre-palatial Minoans were quite busy on the waters of the Mediterranean. It makes sense that a concentration of Minoan artifacts would be found close to Crete, and north of Crete in the Cyclades, since the sailing between those islands would have been easier than venturing out south or east from Crete. As the non-existent clocks of the Bronze Age shifted past 2000 BCE, Minoan Crete seems to have started expanding rapidly. It probably helped, as I mentioned earlier, that they survived relatively unscathed from the Aegean upheaval of the early Bronze Age. One theory to explain the rapid expansion of Crete at the turn of the 20th century BCE focuses on the idea that there could have been an influx of migrants from the coast of the Levant, as it was around the same time that Lugal Zagazi, the Mesopotamian ruler of the Third Dynasty of Ur, opened the way to the upper sea of the setting sun, as they called it, though this theory has taken some heat in recent years, and it may not be accurate. Regardless of what spurred the Minoan growth, though, they built off of their pre-existing culture on Crete. And while Minoan seals show us continued evidence of sailing and maritime activity in the early second millennium, it is evidence from other locations in the ancient world that gives us a closer glimpse at just how far Minoan culture began to reach. The dawn of the 20th century BCE in Crete is also seen as the beginning of the palatial period, which is itself divided into two sub-periods. The old palatial period, the proto-palatial, spans from around 2000 BCE up to 1700, and then the new period, or the neo-palatial, spans from around 1700 up to 1400 BCE. Essentially then, the 20th century BCE saw Minoan Crete visibly expand their reach and their culture. They'd always had some measure of contact in and around the Mediterranean, but the proto-palatial period shows signs of increasing wealth on Crete, while we simultaneously see signs of their artistic culture being spread as far away as Egypt, but more frequently to the Levant coast and to Anatolia. For instance, a hallmark of Minoan Crete's culture is the exquisite pottery that was made on Crete. One such example, dated to around 1850 BCE, was discovered in the tomb of a man who is thought to have been a prince at Byblos, a city on the Levant coast, the very Byblos that later became the center of the Phoenician Empire, another place that we'll discuss further in due time. The item from the palatial period that is perhaps the perfect microcosm of my point is something that's now known as the Todd Treasure, a treasure that's currently divided between the Egyptian Museum and the Louvre. I briefly alluded to this treasure in episode 8, where we looked at Middle Kingdom mariners of Egypt, though I don't think I referred to the treasure by name back then. Anyway, the treasure was unearthed in Egypt, where it was buried in the foundation sand beneath the floor of the temple of Senusret I. The treasure was contained in four copper chests inscribed with the name of Senusret's son, Amenhemat II, a 12th dynasty pharaoh of Egypt. This father-son pair of Egyptian kings ruled over a span of years between 1934 and and 1890 BCE. Thus, the Todd treasure must have arrived in Egypt and been buried at some point before or during the life of one of the two pharaohs with which it's associated, which then dates the treasure to the early 2nd millennium BCE, the very time that Minoan Crete is beginning to expand. It's the content of these Egyptian treasure chests that really illuminates the interwoven nature of the Bronze Age world, however. I've taken the following description of the treasure from the Louvre's page, where you can see some fine images of the treasure also. It says, 
The copper chests were found to contain lapis lazuli, silver ingots, chains, and 153 vases, along with some gold items. These pieces of silver and gold ware were clearly not Egyptian and were different from anything found before. It was possible to identify the lapis lazuli pieces, however. The cylinder seals came from an area stretching from Anatolia to the eastern borders of Iran and were produced throughout the third and into the early second millenniums. The beads and amulets mostly came from Mesopotamia and were made in the latter half of the third millennium. Most of the fragments were too small to be reused. The treasure was a gift to the god Mamthu, sacrificed forever and intended to remain buried. The origin of the silver cups is an ongoing mystery. They look like ceramics from the Cretan Minoan civilization, which may have imitated metal forms never found outside Todd. Metal was indeed melted down with every generation to meet new tastes and requirements. The Egyptian soil may have preserved metal models that were destroyed elsewhere. Some archaeologists have suggested the mining region of Anatolia or northern Syria, an area of magnificent craftsmanship where fine tableware held an important place in commercial and diplomatic exchanges during the second millennium, on the evidence of archives found in the Palace of Mari. Craftsmen might copy foreign styles, such as that of Minoan art. If the treasure was gathered in northern Syria, it could be a reflection of several styles. Indeed, Egypt's relations with the Levantine coast, especially Byblos, were intense during this period. Essentially, then, the Todd treasure is the perfect picture of how different cultures converged at different places throughout the ancient world, especially at the turn of the second millennium. Buried in a palace in Egypt, we find goods from Mesopotamia, Syria, Anatolia, and possibly even Minoan Crete. There's enough evidence for Minoan goods and trade throughout the ancient world, continuing later into the second millennium BCE, that I could never hope to cover it all here. Some have doubted that Crete was even capable of sailing to Egypt or Syria at this point in their history. However, the presence of intercultural trade would suggest that they were at least capable, and probably did so frequently. In the Odyssey, we see a description of the Mediterranean winds that made travel between Crete and Egypt a fairly easy affair. Odysseus, on arriving home in Ithaca, disguised as a Cretan merchant, was described by Homer as saying, My heart impelled me to make a voyage to Egypt with gallant comrades and with ships well fitted. Nine ships I fitted and my force was soon gathered. For six days afterwards, my trusty comrades feasted. Embarking on the seventh, we sailed from lowland Crete, the north wind fresh and fair, and moved off easily as if downstream. No ship met harm, but safe and sound we sat, while wind and helmsmen kept us steady. In five days we arrived at Egypt's flowing stream, and in the Egyptian river I anchored my curved ships. As Odysseus knew, and as the Minoan Cretans would also have known, the Mediterranean wind makes the southward journey from Crete to Egypt a simple affair to the knowledgeable sailor. The important point in all of this, though, is that as Minoan culture expanded, so did their trade contacts. We'll soon see that their commercial interests would be important to their survival as a society. This point gets us back to our earlier discussion of whether Minoan Crete possessed a thalassocracy or not. There is evidence of their cultural reach all across the Aegean. From their stately palaces on Crete to the similar palaces in the Cyclades and Minoan trading outposts in the Levant and Anatolia, we know that Crete had a far-reaching presence. Further, the far-flung places to which their pottery, artwork, and other wares reached tells us that they must have been quite active in the Mediterranean, 
The problem comes in the fact that we don't have any physical shipwrecks or remains of Minoan vessels themselves to know whether any of their activity was of a military nature. Nor do we have any evidence to give us an idea about how tight their control was of Cretan style palaces outside Crete itself. There are a few Minoan shipwrecks that have been found thus far, where the physical ship itself is disintegrated and gone, and all that remains to identify the shipwreck are amphorae that sit on the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. But these shipwrecks also don't give us a full picture of how Crete would have exercised control over the Mediterranean. They just give us further confirmation of the fact that the Minoans were very active commercially. Those who stand behind the Thalassocracy theory rightly claim that any culture with a commercial network as wide as that of Minoan Crete would have eventually dealt with the security of that trade network in order to keep it secure. And I tend to agree with them on this point. Even though I won't delve into it today, pirates have always been attracted to material wealth, something that Crete possessed in large measure. I don't remember if Captain Craig Buddy discusses Aegean piracy quite this far back into history, and even if he doesn't, you should still check out the History of Pirates podcast. But no matter what, at the end of the day, it's highly likely that the Minoans had to deal with piracy on some level. Again, the problem is that we don't know much about it based on archaeological evidence. We can just surmise based on the physical evidence of their commercial reach. Beyond that, proponents of the Thalassocracy theory also claim that the existence of palaces around the Aegean is a sign that Crete exercised direct political control over an empire of the sea. And at first glance, it may seem like they have a point. After all, isn't one sign of an empire that there is a somewhat consistent style of cultural unity throughout the empire? An empire like Rome, for instance. This question presents a somewhat more difficult puzzle, but again, there's not enough evidence here to weigh in presumption of a Minoan empire. Yes, there were palaces after the style of Knossos on Crete, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Crete also exercised control over the palaces. I personally think that a Cretan thalassocracy doesn't quite add up, and that their influence was certainly artistic and cultural, but that these palaces could easily have been imitation wrought by close relation culturally and geographically, and that we just don't have enough evidence to support a view of Minoan Empire centered on military control. An interesting recent theory is that Thucydides' characterization of King Minos as a naval leader was not historically accurate, and was instead an exaggeration made to bolster and reflect his fellow Athenians' concerns about piracy, trade, and similar issues in 5th century BC Athens, a place that could legitimately look to Crete for inspiration. It's all a bit messy trying to figure out what motivated historians of Thucydides' era, especially when they're writing about cultures that were over a thousand years removed from their own time. But try we must. In the end, perhaps we could call Minoan Crete a cultural empire, if such a thing exists, but that idea is perhaps a bit too abstract to hold much water. Anyway, as the clock wound forward through the second millennium, Minoan Crete continued to trade with the cultures and people of the Near East. My personal favorite items of Minoan origin are the intricately decorated pottery that has been discovered in numerous locations around the Mediterranean and the Near East. This style of pottery decoration happened after what has been called the Great Earthquake an event that devastated some of the early Minoan palaces, around 1700 BCE. The palaces were rebuilt, the distinguishing line between the proto-palatial and neo-palatial periods, and trade continued as it had before. To a degree, the rebuilding efforts corresponded with a revitalization of trade, 
and it was during this period that the famous Minoan decorated pottery was ubiquitous. There's one specific potted vase that I'll discuss in a moment, but it bears mention that Crete's strong commercial ties with other civilizations around the Mediterranean probably went a long way in helping Crete rebuild from the earthquake in the way that it did. I'll post some pictures of Minoan pottery that I find fascinating, with the relevant origin info for each, but a specific vase found at Colana, on the island of Aegina, bears images of ships that are related to the point at hand. The vase is dated to a period between 1750 to 1650 BCE, so it could have been made either before or after the earthquake. Either way, however, the ships depicted on the vase bear a striking resemblance to ships that were depicted on Egyptian artwork from a similar time period, something that's not altogether surprising when we consider the connections that existed between the two civilizations and that we've seen so far. The main difference for us is that Egypt gave us physical ship remains to examine and learn from, while Minoan Crete has not been quite so kind to history yet. There are so many pictorial remains related to Minoan maritime history that I could go through them in dull fashion for hours, but I'll spare you the, well, pleasure isn't the right word, but I'll spare you nonetheless. The most fascinatingly detailed and enlightening of Minoan maritime artifacts is one that I'll leave for our next episode, but I'll at least tell you what it is today. It's none other than a set of wall paintings found in the town of Akrotiri, on the Cycladic island of Thera, about 70 miles north of Crete. The wall paintings are marvelous and tell us a lot about Minoan maritime history, so I plan to discuss them in depth. The island of Thera, though, is important for another reason that I also plan to build our next episode around. The dates aren't agreed upon by all scholars. Some say it happened in 1628 BCE, and some say nearer to 1500, quite a gap there in the estimations. In the end, though, Thera was the site of a massive volcanic explosion that essentially destroyed the island and wrought a fair amount of damage to Crete and some of the other Cycladic islands. Minoan power had been waning a little bit prior to the Thera eruption, and perhaps due in part to the effects of the eruption, Minoan power seems to have drastically declined in the same period. So, for the bulk of our next episode, I want to look at the eruption, what we know about it, and then indulge my curiosity a bit and explore the possibility that the Thera eruption may have been the real-life event which formed the basis for the famous legend of Atlantis, most well associated with Plato's reference to a great island that was home to a powerful civilization which vanished under the sea in a day and a night. The theory is by no means new, but I didn't know much about it until recently, and it makes for some intriguing possibilities, so I hope you all don't mind if we veer into conspiracy-ish territory for what should be an enjoyable episode next time. That wraps up the material that I have prepared for today's episode. As usual, I hope you'll stop by the website to check out the images and sources from the episode. Feel free to share the episode on social media if you found it interesting as well. My last item for today gets back to the book giveaway that I referenced at the beginning of the episode. As I said then, the book is called Wreck of the Whale Ship Essex, the extraordinary and distressing memoir that inspired Herman Melville's Moby Dick. I haven't read the entire thing, but I've read a good chunk of it, and greatly enjoyed the text itself, but the illustrations are what really make this book come to life. The backbone of the book is Owen Chase's tale about the wreck of the whale ship Essex. The event really happened, and later inspired Herman Melville to write Moby Dick, but I think that one of the enjoyable parts of the book is that Chase's tale is a first-hand account, a retelling of what he experienced aboard the ill-fated ship. To make a long story short, 
The whale ship was sunk by a angry sperm whale in the South Pacific in 1820. Chase wrote, I turned around and saw him about 100 rods, 500 meters or so, directly ahead of us, coming down with twice his ordinary speed of around 24 knots, and it appeared with tenfold fury and vengeance in his aspect. The surf flew in all directions about him with the continual violent thrashing of his tail, his head about half out of the water, and in that way he came upon us and again struck the ship. Most of the crew survived the initial shipwreck and managed to make it aboard one of their three small whale boats, but they'd lost most of their food and fresh water and were stranded over 2,000 miles west of South America, far away from any islands even. Some managed to return to civilization, although they had to resort to cannibalism in order to survive that long. Others of the crew died in the middle of the ocean. It's quite a gripping tale told from the perspective of a man who lived through the ordeal himself, so it's well worth the read. And then, in addition, there are quite a few short essays scattered throughout the book to explain the history and background of whaling as an industry, how Melville adapted the true story into Moby Dick, as well as a few shorter tales of other whaling ship incidents. All in all, it's a good book without the illustrations, but the 150 or so color illustrations really tie it all together, and they're quite well done. I'm sure by now you're wondering how to enter the giveaway, so here's how I would prefer to do it, and I think this way is best. iTunes ratings and reviews are an easy and a free way to help the podcast out. So for those of you who listen through iTunes, all you have to do to enter is leave a review of the podcast. Then, just find the podcast page on Facebook or Twitter and shoot me a message, or even email me. The email address is my name, Brandon, at MaritimeHistoryPodcast.com. Tell me your iTunes username so that I can verify your review is there, and then you're entered. I'll put everyone into a random drawing and see who has Lady Luck on their side. I would guess, though, that this method covers a majority of you, but for those of you who listen through other methods, either just leave a review on your platform of choice and notify me through the same means, or simply tell a friend about the podcast on social media, or through the good old-fashioned method of face-to-face -face communication or in a postcard, or a handwritten letter, a message in a bottle, even a carrier pigeon, I guess, works. Smoke signals. The possibilities are endless, really, and I'll take your word for it that you've done so. Again, just message me on social media or email me that you've done one of the above, and I'll enter you into the drawing. I hope that this approach sounds workable to everyone, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how it all turns out. I've got some more books lined up for future giveaways, so even if you don't win this time, a review now will get you entered for our future giveaways as well. Thanks so much, everyone. That's it for today, and until next time, thanks for listening to the Maritime History Podcast. <laughs>